Today we'll cover maybe two things. They're both kind of short. The Gram Schmidt process. First of all, though, and let's start by saying what this process is. Given a basis of some subspace of Rn, we want to find an orthogonal basis. We've talked about the advantages of having orthogonal bases. For example, if we want to project the vector onto this space, our formula assumes that we have an orthogonal basis. So the Gram-Schmidt process is going to take a basis and turn it into an orthogonal basis. It's Pretty straightforward, maybe kind of tedious if you're working with a lot of vectors, but let's look. I mean, let's just look at R2. Um, any two linearly independent vectors are a basis of R2. So this is this vector and this vector taken together form a basis. Now, well, if we performed an orthogonal projection of one of these vectors onto the other, these two vectors now are also a basis of R2 and they're an orthogonal basis. So that's the basis as it were of the Gram-Schmidt process. It's just a bunch of orthogonal projections. We'll present the process and do an example. Let's say we have vectors x1, x2, up to xp. And we're going to Our goal is going to be to create vectors V1, V2, up to Vp, where this new set of vectors is also a basis and is orthogonal. And we're actually going to get accomplish something in addition to that. We're going to get this situation where the span of x1 equals the span of v1 the span of x1 and x2 is the same as the span of v1 and v2, and so on down the line. 
So that's our goal, and that's what I've claimed this Gram-Schmidt process is able to do. Let's see if let's try to try to do this. So V1 is just going to be X1. No problem. So for V2, what we're going to do is we're going to take V1 and we're going to take, um, sorry, we're going to take X2. And we're going to take V1 and we're going to perform an orthogonal projection X2 onto V1. And the result of this orthogonal projection is going to be V sub 2. So X2 equals, sorry, lots of V2 equals X2 minus X2 dot V1 over V1 dot V1 times V1. And there is V2. Or V3. Okay, so we now have V1 and V2. And these two vectors span some space. We are going to look at the space they span. And we're going to look at X3. And we're going to take X3 and we're going to project it orthogonally onto the span of V1 and V2. And because V1 and V2 are orthogonal, we have a form to the for this. Remember that our projection form to the onto a space requires that we have an orthogonal basis. Well, I know it hardly looks that way from my picture, but V1 and V2 are orthogonal vectors. So V3 equals X3 minus x3 dot v1 over v1 dot v1 times v1 minus x3 dot v2 over v2 dot v2 times v2. And this pattern keeps on repeating. I mean, once we get to V4, I can no longer draw pictures for you of orthogonal projections onto three-dimensional spaces, but it's just this pattern. We, V4 equals X4 minus, and then we project on to V1. And we project on to V2. And we project on to V3.
So the Gram-Schmidt process isn't really hard. It's obviously one of those things that in any real world situation, you'd really want to be doing this on a computer, not, you know, calculating all of these dot products by hand that would get uh, out of control very quickly. But I mean, it's not hard conceptually. It's just a bunch of projections like so. And if we absolutely had to do an example, let's look at our four and we can look at the span of three vectors in our four. And these vectors are a basis of a three-dimensional subspace. I'm not putting in the work to show you this, but they are linearly independent, so they are a basis. And they're not an orthogonal basis. Like the dot product of those first two vectors is three. So we could make this basis be an orthogonal basis via the Gram-Schmidt process. We'll label these x1, x2, x3. Going through the Gram-Schmidt process, v1, is just x1, so nothing to do there. V2 is x2 minus x2 dot v1 over v1 dot v1 times v1. I, I assume, I've never actually checked, I assume that in your calculator there is some kind of dot product command, but given how inefficient your calculator is in terms of like you'd have to enter those vectors into it, it's probably easiest to do this by hand. Uh, since I've reminded myself that the calculator exists, though, I will want it later in the class. So let's get that loaded. Um, so x2 dot uh, v1. Well, here's x2, here's v1. So, uh, three, zero, one, 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 zero plus one plus one plus one is three. And let me go ahead and put X two down as well. V one dot V one. Four times V one so negative three fourths one fourth one-fourth, one-fourth. 
uh, assuming that I'm doing all of this mental arithmetic correctly. Uh, we see immediately, by the way, that orthogonal bases often look worse than non-orthogonal bases. Like when I was finding eigenvectors, I'd always think, let's pick this number so that we don't have any fractions. But we're going to get a basis from this process that looks worse than our original basis, um, but has the nice property of orthogonality. So sometimes appearances are deceiving. Let's... And the fractions do make, make it a headache once you, let's just erase all this. And the uh, fractions are going to make a, it a headache once we start taking dot products involving these fractions, but that just is what it is. Um, the, the three is X three minus X three dot V one over V one dot V one times V one minus X three dot V two over v2 dot v2 times v2. So, all righty, let's see what we can do. Let's see if we can do this in our head. Here's x3, there's v1. So first of all, here is X3. X3 dot V1, I make that two. One times one, one times one. These zeros give us zero. Uh, V1 dot V1. Should be four. One times one, one times one, one times one, one times one, add them up, you get four. So, and V1 is this. And here's where things are going to take a turn for the worse. X3 dot V2. So X three dot V two. Um, I guess that's not really so bad. That should be one half. V two dot V two. We are now beyond my ability to just quickly do this in my head. Well, I guess for not, this should be 12 sixteenths, um, 9 sixteenths, which dot, yeah, 9 sixteenths, 1 sixteenth, 1 sixteenth. One sixteenth should give us twelve sixteenths. Times 
negative three fourths, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. Let me see, 12 sixteenths is three fourths. One half divided by three fourths is four sixths or two thirds. So, we're going to wind up with zero, zero, one, one, minus, let's see, this three and this four are going to give us twelfths. So that's right, two fourths as six twelfths, so that we'll have a common denominator. Minus try to keep this stuff from all running together. Minus, uh, let's see, two thirds times negative three fourths, so negative six twelfths. Two thirds times one fourth, so uh, two twelfths. Two twelfths. Two twelfths. Equals. Ooh, okay. Negative six twelfths. Minus negative six twelfths. I make that a zero up there. Negative six twelfths minus two twelfths, negative eight twelfths, and then negative eight twelfths, negative eight twelfths. So Zero, negative two thirds. Since you're taking one minus the six twelfths minus the two twelfths, would be you're right. I forgot about this one. Twelve twelfths minus six twelfths is six twelfths minus two is positive four. Twelfths and then uh, positive four twelfths again. So unless I Obviously, all of that trying to do mental arithmetic quickly, but unless I botched some multiplication up, that is now an orthogonal basis of W. And I can at least verify in my head that V1 dot V2 is zero and V1 dot V3 is zero. So let me see. 
Yeah, and negative two twelve um, plus one twelfth plus one twelfth is also zero. So this is an orthogonal basis. <laughs> I got a got a little copy. It might have been faster to just bite the bullet plug those into your calculator and make your calculator do the dot products for you after all. But we got there in the end. Um, this is orthogonal. You could go further if you wanted to. Some people say this is part of the Gram-Schmidt process. I don't but you could normalize each of these vectors to get an orthonormal basis. Remember that normalizing a vector is just dividing it by its length. So that's the Gram-Schmidt process. Brief section, not a whole lot to say about it. Let's do something else now. Next section. We are, because I, I made an announcement, but just so we're definitely on the same page, our test is next week. So I'm going to have to find something uh, to open for Thursday's class, but I'll get that done today. The topic I want to cover now is polynomial regression and least squares problems. So if we want to find a polynomial through a point that is, uh, or that can be done using linear algebra, it's, it's pretty, pretty basic as follows. Find a quadratic through the points one, three, the points four, six, and the point seven, two. So I think there was a homework assignment like this, but that would obviously have been long ago. So to refresh our memory about why this is a linear algebra problem, you want a quadratic I equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And when uh, x is one, we want y to be three. So we want three to be A plus B plus C. That's what we get for plugging in X equals one, Y equals three. Similarly, from the second point, when X is four, we want Y to be six. So we want six to be 16A plus four B plus C. And when X is seven, we want Y to be a two. So we want two to be 49A plus seven B plus C. And this is a system of linear equations. Our variables or our unknowns are A, B, and C. And we can 
plug this into our calculator. Let's see, go ahead and share this for online students. So let's see. I remember nothing. We have three equations and three variables plus the constants. And the first was one, 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 something. Three. Three. What, what was the second? Uh, 16, four, one, six. <laughs> The third? 49, 7, 1, 2. OK, so matrix math reduced row echelon form A. So here's, I mean, we could put this. Uh, we could maybe make this look nicer, but if when you're doing a polynomial regression, you've just got to usually kind of accept that you're getting ugly decimals. I mean, I don't, these are ugly fractions too. So A is negative 3.8 repeating. B is 2.94 repeating, and C is 0 0.4 repeating. All right. What if you added an additional condition? What if you said, in addition to wanting to go through these points, I would like for this quadratic to go through the point eight one. Well, that would give us an additional equation to be satisfied. Let's see, that's another row. 64, 8, 1. One was it? Sixty four eight one one. That's right. And you can, I mean, you can maybe guess what's going to happen. We already found the quadratic that goes through the first three points, and that quadratic doesn't go through this point eight one. If you perform your reduced row echelon form, you get, you find that the system is inconsistent. This last row is telling you that zero equals one. So, no, uh, no, uh, um, no quadratic going through those points. Connecting this or introducing the idea of polynomial regression. In general, I mean, the situation where you want to use a quadratic, but the quadratic doesn't go through the points is not some kind of free thing. I mean, say that you have a collection of data 
that looks something like this. I mean, in general, this data, theory looks quadratic, but there's no quadratic polynomial you can draw that is actually going to go through all of those points. This gives us the idea of quadratic progression where we want to find the quadratic that comes as close as possible to passing through, I wish Zoom wouldn't do this. I don't know if this is saying that our internet is being weird or what, but sorry for the handwriting. So find a quadratic that comes as close as possible to passing through all the points. That would be a, an example of a polynomial regression, more specifically a quadratic regression. I mean, when we first introduce this material to students, it's usually in the context of linear regression, but it's the same idea. We have data that's basically linear, I mean, basically in the form of a line, but there's clearly no line you can draw that passes through all of these points. So you talk about the line of best fit, and that's the same thing trying to find a first degree polynomial that comes as close to going through all of the points as possible. So what's all of this have to do with um, with the material we've been covering, with these orthogonal projections. Well, notice or remember that a system of linear equations can always be written as AX equals B. So here, um, this is the matrix 1, 1, 1, 16, 4, 1, 49, 7, 1, 64, 8, 1, times the unknown vector A, B, C equals the vector 3, 6, 2, 1. And this matrix equation has no solutions. Why doesn't this matrix equation have solutions? I mean, from a linear algebra point of view. Well, AX equals B 
needed as solutions at, I mean, has at least one solution if and only if this vector B is in the column space of the matrix. One of those theorems that we state and then never do much with, and then suddenly it's important again. <laughs> Linear algebra is rife with such things. So the reason that this system is inconsistent is that we've got the column space of A, which is not really a lie. It's a thing in four dimensional space. Bear with me, but we've got the column space of A. And then we've got this vector three, six, two, one. And this vector isn't in the column space of the matrix. So suppose. I mean, we've accepted that there's no way to literally do this, no way to literally find the quadratic through those points. Suppose we had said, okay, but let's at least do quadratic regression. If we don't have a solution, let's try to find the values of A, B, and C that are as close to a solution as we can find. Well, if we call this B, there's a point in the column space that's as close to B as possible. Let's call this B tilde. And we uh, know, we talked about this earlier, that B tilde is the orthogonal projection. We find B tilde by creating that right angle. The idea behind the orthogonal projection is, okay, you can't solve AX equals B. You can solve AX equals B tilde, though. B tilde is in the column space of A, so AX equals B tilde does have solutions. And you, you sort of rationalize that because B tilde is close to B, or as close to B as it's possible to get, then AX equals B tilde is as close to a solution to AX equals B as it's possible to get. So your solution to this equation, it's called the least squares solution. And your least square solution is also the best fit polynomial. This is what you'd get if you went to your calculator and you performed quadratic regression on, um, on those points. This is the idea behind these square solutions. Um, 
actually doing them this way would be a headache because to do this, well, first you have to project B onto the column space of A. You do not presumably have an orthogonal basis of the column space of A. You have a basis or you have a spanning set. The columns of A are a spanning set. But there's no reason that the columns of A should be orthogonal. To do this projection, you need an orthogonal basis. So first you'd have to perform the Gram-Schmidt process on the columns of A to turn them into an orthogonal basis. Then you'd actually do the projection. Then you'd solve AX equals B tilde. That's kind of a lot. Um, fortunately, there's a shortcut. You don't actually have to do all of that work. We're going to introduce what are called the normal equations. No, we are not, because I don't have the normal equations memorized, and they are not in my notes. And an error on my part that I apologize for. But OK, we'll finish this up on Thursday then, and we'll start something new. I'm not, we, I'm not entirely sure what but something, and we'll have our test. I mean, it can just be the last day of class, I guess, unless people would rather have it Tuesday. No great consensus for having it Tuesday. Thursday it is. So is it like the final test or? Uh, no, this will be just, Yes. How many tests have we had, actually? Two, two, two. This will be three. Yeah, the final will be four. Yeah, okay. This will be test three, then. You well, maybe in the syllabus it only says two tests, but three tests is fine. 